Hi, I'm Lori Brown. Let's ponder cast. So Gord Downey. On October 17th, I was in England and staying in a place that had no phone reception and no internet. We were in the car driving, and all of a sudden my phone rang up on top of a hill, and it was Q asking if I would say something about Gord Downey's dying, and I did. But ever since he was diagnosed with brain cancer, and I think I talked about him then, I couldn't pitch my brain forward to the day he died. I didn't want to. I didn't want to think about what it is that I would say, how I would try to sum up his legacy, his importance to us all. It was too hard, too awful. It's almost as if I thought, well, if I don't really think about it, maybe it won't happen. It felt so strange being so far away from home on that day. Did you see that Facebook meme go around that said, Canada closed, there's been a death in the family? That felt about right. The outpouring for Gord Downey got me thinking about why do we feel so close to him? Close to the tragically hit, but really close to Gord. It's as if we think we know him. And he knows us. On Facebook, you guys had some great comments about that as I'm trying to figure out how he wormed his way into our hearts. Tristan said he gave 150% all the time. How he made that so apparent to all of us sitting in the audience, we knew he was doing it for us. Jim said, seeing the hip live felt like they were playing for him. Yeah, and that's where the energy was focused. It was so focused on the audience. The hip has always been audience first, never truly into the whole video game, never sort of playing the industry. You can tell that the industry was just something in between them and their audience. Justin said, I don't know him, but he made me feel like I knew myself better and this place better. Yeah. On the album that's just come out called Introduce Yourself, Gord's solo album, I listened to that just now before I decided to record, and there is a song where he says that my greatest love is Lake Ontario. So we wrote about stuff that that we knew. I guess that made us feel like we knew him. George wrote, He opened his soul to us, and that's why we love him and hold him dear. And in opening up a soul, what does that mean when you open up your soul? I think it means making yourself vulnerable. On stage, he did things that could have had people in the audience laughing and jeering and thinking that he's out of his mind. But that kind of openness and freedom, it has the opposite effect. Ron wrote that he was an outlier and quietly unapologetic for it. That's my favorite. Which, you know, in this world where we are all weirdos, that's very comforting. Cheryl wrote about his authenticity and how he was painfully honest and vulnerable. And at the end, it was profoundly uncomfortable to watch the Hips final tour, but he didn't shy away from that at all. And that's That kind of brutal honesty is not something you see very often. And of course, we don't see that situation very often where there's a guy on stage knowing that he's going to die of brain cancer and going for it like it's the last time because it is the last time. 
The audience was always first with Gord and the hip. They had a magical way of making us feel important. What we thought, what we loved, where we lived, and what we dream about. I felt a huge amount of respect from Downey and the band towards me in the audience, towards us all. When I first heard the name of the band, I was working at Much Music, and someone said, yeah, well, look at this. They're from Kingston. They're called the Tragically Hip. And I laughed, and I said, that's a brilliant name, really funny, but they're going to regret that. When they get big and rich and famous, that they're going to outgrow that name. They should change it now. Yeah. Just giving everything all out is actually the easiest thing to do. And that's like super, just all emotion, and the lyrics get me there, and the music the band provides gets me there. I feel the same way you do, in that I think Gord Downey knew me well, and I knew him really well. Maybe I had more moments where I was actually in a room with him, and speaking with him, and interviewing him. But it goes beyond that. It, it feels there's a closeness there that defies description, and it's not logical. How did he do that? I always felt like I was trying to keep up with Gord and his lyrics and the songs. Like, Gord was skating to where the puck was going to be, and I was just trying to keep up with him. He was trying to show me the way. The lyrics were mysterious, They were mythical, but they felt like there were huge gaps in them, like he would send out part of a a signal, a code, but there'd be great bits missing in between. And that's where you and I filled in the blanks. That's where we were left room to add our own meaning and to make a complete picture. When you talk to Gord in person, it was kind of like that, too. He spoke in a lot of non sequiturs, which was really frustrating when you're interviewing and trying to, you know, edit together an interview. It was brutal. But it's that same thing. His mind was just leaping from thought to thought to idea to feeling, and he was going so fast, it was almost impossible to keep up with him. He wrote in Semaphore. It was a secret language that we Canadians learned how to understand. There were signposts and places along the way that we knew and we could fall back on. I think about Glenn Gould and his idea of North. And I think about what Northrop Fry has written about Canada. And I I want to put Gord Downey. I want to put Gord Downey in there with those two men. I had a remarkable opportunity a few years ago for the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame, and they wanted to have Gord Downey and Gordon Lightfoot on stage together. And I would be there to help the two guys interview each other, and they would play for each other as well. So we set up a meeting in Gordon Lightfoot's kitchen, and Gord Downey and his manager showed up, and Gordon Lightfoot was there and me. And we sat down and talked about how the evening might go. It was one of those rooms (laughs) that I wish you all could have been there with me and to listen to these two giants trying to find the spot where they both connected. Downey was so over the moon about this opportunity, and Lightfoot was slightly freaked out because he didn't know uh, very much about the hip at all, and he really felt like he was going to be at a disadvantage. Gord pulled out a little notebook and flipped it open, and it looked just like a, a policeman's notebook, and he started making notes. He had so many things that he wanted to say. We drank coffee. We talked about music, how it might go. I would help them and prompt them and try to focus the whole friggin' thing 
which was going to be impossible because not only does Gord Downey speak in complete non sequiturs, so does Gordon Lightfoot. I didn't know if there was going to be one complete sentence come out of that night or not. On the website, I have posted a link where you can actually hear that whole interview that happened on stage, 20, I think that was 2013. We got up to leave Gordon Lightfoot's kitchen, and I said to Gord, you know, you look just like a cop standing there making notes on Gordon Lightfoot. It was quite a wild image for me, and he laughed. The night happened. And it was remarkable and strange, and there were moments of brilliance, and there was moments of awkwardness. And afterwards, Gord gave me a notebook, just like the one that he had used. And I'm looking at it right now. This is where I've decided to make some notes about what I would say about Gord Downey's passing. After the gig with Lightfoot, I went back to Gord's dressing room and laid out on the table was a book full of his notes. It was a big book, like the pages were about 11 by 18. And on the open pages were notes that he had scrawled about what it is he wanted to talk to Gordon Lightfoot about. Gord Downey always used a four-colored pen you might remember those in school. You can put down the, the red one, the green one, the blue one, or the black one. And he used those to make notes all the time. There were no lines on the page. <laughs> Nothing was straight. There were little quotes and then big lines attaching it to something over on the other page in four different colors, some things in bold, some things underlined. And I looked at Gord and I said, my God, this looks just like the inside of your brain. Can I take a picture? And he said, yeah, sure. So I took a picture of those notes and I blew them up and I have them on my wall. Gord Downey, thinking and writing about Gordon Lightfoot. And it's one of my most prized possessions. And it reads like a secret treasure map. I take a look at something and say, what does he mean by that? And I look where the arrow leads and I try to connect the two things. That's kind of just the way his music worked. Gord was not a natural musician in a lot of ways you might think. When he would be writing in Toronto for the rest of the band and working out a song on the piano, he would have a video camera set up over his shoulder to look down at his hands and record that, and then he would send that to the rest of the guys because he had no idea what he was playing. He had no idea what the chords were called, and that's the way that he communicated. That completely adds to the feeling that the hip songs come from somewhere else, that they aren't usually a structure that you can understand. They, they don't move around a lot musically. Who moves around a lot is Gord going way up, way down, the gymnast in the middle of that amazing band. He told me that when you're standing on stage with the tragically hip behind you, it is like standing right beside a jet about to take off, the power and the energy of that band. He said, that is, that is what pushes me to give the performance that I can. He also told me that if he could, he would reach into his chest, pull out his heart, and give it to the audience. Never got a sense of ego from Gord Downey. All the stories that you've heard since he died about kindness, and being loving, and being helpful, and being a really big, supportive part of the Canadian music industry, that's all real. I've worked with his brother, Mike Downey, a documentary filmmaker. I worked with him when I was on Newsworld, and I got to know the family better. And when they made the video Bob Cajun, I was asked if I would be in it. Of all the hip songs, of all the videos, to be able to be in that one was, was such an honor. Afterwards, 
I met Gord somewhere, and I told him so. And he said, well, yeah, that song. He says, there's a really big word in that song. I said, constellation, that's a pretty big word. And he says, I'm working on another one, indefatigable. I'm trying to work that into a piece now. I think my body's basically giving subtext for anybody out here that, you know, uh, is big on meaning. Then I'll get, then they can look at my body. <laughs> I give you my body. And with my voice, I'll give you, uh, you know, I'll give you the confines of my heart, which is illegible. So what do we do now? We humans have a very interesting way of telling stories about the recently deceased. I think it's probably a way to try to acclimatize ourselves to the fact that they've really gone. We're a bit in denial, so we tell stories for a while to help us piece together this new reality. If you've had a loved one die, you know the thrill of years later, someone coming up, a friend of your mother's or father's, and saying, oh, I knew your mother when she was a kid, and then tell you a story about them that you've never heard before. The joy of that, hey? Maybe that's what we're doing for each other. We all want a little more Gord Downey. There is a little more Gord Downey, and it's a solo album that's just come out, and it's called Introduce Yourself. When his memory and brain was going, he was losing names. And so he would write on his hand, Introduce Yourself, and he would lean over and poke you and then open his hand and you realized you needed to tell Gord who you were. Listening to this album is a heartbreaking experience, and I'll listen to it again and again. It's, it's different from Bowie's Black Star, which focused on the, a lot on the terror of knowing you're dying, which Gord could have easily done, I imagine. But instead, he wrote this album about people he knew and loved and were important to him, so you can imagine trying to listen to an album that is about the love of his life, that's about his children, that's about his family, that's about his dog, that's about his love for Lake Ontario. It is heartbreaking, but beautifully done, produced, and partly written by Kevin Drew. I wish I could play it for you here, but can't do that. This album is not about terror. It is an album full of gratitude and longing and memory. First Person is the first track of the album. And basically, he is saying goodbye. And he just says over and over again, goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Yeah, that's quite an opener. But he's talking about someone who is a partner, a first love, who explained to Gord what it is that he was doing with the hip. There are things that a partner can see and sum up in a way that you can't when you're standing right in the middle of the storm. And this person said to him, what you do is you, which is a very clear directive. And I'm so glad that she said that to him. That became his thing, is to be as much me as I possibly can be, and he did it right to the end. He writes about his children, which I think is the hardest thing at all. There's a track called Bedtime. It's all about sitting in a rocking chair with a sleeping child in your arms, and that very careful, dangerous, quiet move to get that sleeping baby from the rocking chair up over to the crib, down into the crib, and then slowly walking, hopefully where the floors don't creak, until you can get outside the room. And he writes about holding his child and getting it right over to the crib like he was carrying a bomb, and walking so carefully, and that the moment that the door was closed to within an inch and he thought he was free. The baby wakes up crying, 
um, as if he was watching him all the time and saying, come back to me, come back. So the song is about returning to this child again and again, which when you can't return anymore makes that uh, a tough one. There's a piece called Spoon on the album. There was a time when one of Gord's uh, children was quite young. I think he was about six or something like that. And he broke his leg. And he couldn't go anywhere. And Gord just decided that he was going to take a month or something like that. He was going to take a huge, long amount of time and just be there to help his son. He basically carried him everywhere. He took him traveling, and he wrote a song about it. Yeah, that's another toughie on the album. He writes about his brothers. He writes a piece called Faith, Faith, and it's about a dog. It's about unconditional love. I think Gord was always pointing towards that. Maybe the dog was his model. He wanted to get there. He writes about the band. It's called Love Over Money. He calls the love that the band members had for each other. He says that love was broken and repaired. He said, love, that's how we got good. There is a song about the Boston Bruins. <laughs> you, me, and the bees. The trading of Joe Thornton gets in there as well. I saw him backstage at a concert about a month after the Boston Bruins had won the Stanley Cup. And I said, Gord, how you doing? He says, well, you may have noticed that the Boston Bruins have won the Stanley Cup. And as far as he was concerned, that made his entire year. At the end of the track, you can hear hockey mini sticks <laughs> playing, which he and his brothers, I'm sure, have done their entire lives. In a typical Gord Downey turn of phrase, there is a track called A Better End. And he's saying, stay. You need to stay to the better end. There's no bitterness here. There is longing and there is love and there is gratitude, loads of gratitude on this record. Don't be afraid of listening to it. Might be a little early for you if you're a huge fan, but don't be afraid of it. It's beautifully done. The heartbreak for me is when I hear what Gord was doing on his solo work, and I was seeing how he was spreading his wings in a completely different direction. I just want more. I want more of that connection with an artist that opened himself up so much and let us in. He opened up so far, I think he did actually reach into his chest and pull out his heart. Gord Downey may have written, don't tell me what the poets are doing, but he was a poet and he didn't talk about that. He didn't talk about the poetry of his words. Instead, he just showed us what poetry was. I think we still need to tell stories about Gord Downey and the hip. To finish off, I wanted to read a poem that one of you posted on uh, the Facebook page. And it's called Our Canadian Heart, and it's by Pamela Betsy Hodges. Tragically hypnotized, when one of us is finished, we do finish. When we have written every possible encouragement, when it is all written, when it is all played out, tragically hypnotized into something else, something else to believe in, holding on like a maple leaf whose facade is cloaked in rich and vibrant red, takes off, parachuting its way, making a dream trip down to earth, down, transformed way down deep. I miss you, and we miss you on this cold branch down eternally, down eternally rocketed into our Creator's beginning and ending because you have always meant forever in our Canadian heart. Have a great night and have a great day.